before we come to uh, God's word, shall we uh, pray? How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Father, we, we thank you for reminding us this morning of your greatness, of your majesty, of your care for us. And we pray, Lord, now that you will turn our hearts to you, that we may be able to hear and receive from your word this morning. Amen. So, um, I was a teenager in the 1980s. Feels a long time ago now. But um, in the church that me and Steve grew up in, um, we uh, were involved in um, Mission England. Do you remember the Billy Graham uh, mission that came um, came to Anfield in Liverpool? And I remember it was, there was quite a lot of excitement in our church because we were all going to go. And as a result of Mission England, there was a new hymn book. And we were very uh, excited because um, the, new, the new hymn book contained lots of choruses that as teenagers we knew were going to replace lots of the hymns that we would have been singing at the time. And... Um, When I knew today that I was going to speak on this topic, one of the hymns, or one of the choruses that we used to sing a lot, it was a favourite at our church, it come into my mind. So, I'll see if you can think of what the chorus might be. My theme for today, and it fits so well in with what um, people have been testifying and what people have been singing about this morning, my theme for today is God is perfect in all of his ways. And so the song that I I used to, or we used to sing a lot, it should, uh, it won't come on from the screen, not quite. Ascribe greatness to our God the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness, without injustice, good and upright is he. Do you remember it? Remember, we don't sing it anymore, do we? But that's the song that immediately came into my mind. Now, I didn't know it at the time, being about, I would have been about 15. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that chorus came from uh, the verse that hopefully we'll see on the screen, Amelia. On the screen, this is the verse that it comes from. Deuteronomy 32, uh, 3 and 4. This is Moses speaking. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Now Moses sang this song towards the end of his life after leading the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And he had a life full of trusting God. He proved his faithfulness. This morning, I don't want to talk about Moses. I want to talk about another hero of the Old Testament. And um, what we're going to look at today was written hundreds of years after Moses. And the verses we're going to look at today were, were, came from a song that, it, although it's at the end of the account of David's life, was probably written a bit before that. But whenever it was written, David talks from experience, as we'll see later. Now, the two versions of what we're going to read um, in the Bible, we're going to read the version from 2 Samuel, uh, uh, chapter 22, but you can also read it in Psalm 18 because it was adapted for corporate worship so the the children of Israel could sing it together. So, let's have a look. I I was in two minds. Shall I read the whole chapter? And I thought, you know what? God's word is much better than anything I'm going to say. So, we're going to read the whole chapter. So... 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 22, starting at the first verse. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold and my refuge, my saviour, you save me from the violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. 
for the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of shoal entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, to my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth, glowing coals flamed forth from, from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him his canopy. Thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundation of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before me, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. With the merciful you show yourself merciful. With the blameless you show yourself blameless. With the purified you deal purely, and with the crooked you make yourself seem torturous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way, is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God? But the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them, I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. Those who hated me, I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as the head of the nations. People who I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, through God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above all those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and show steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So basically that's David giving an account of his experience of the Lord. And some of the things that we've read in that, I think, ooh, I don't, you know, ooh, I don't, know, I don't know whether that's, whether that's how, how, how we should feel. That's, that, was David's, that was David's response to God. But the verse we're going to concentrate today is this, verse 31 and 32. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so it might be a bit to, to yours. It says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. 
He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? So today, I want to set our hearts and our eyes on God, uh, who's perfect in all of his ways, he's perfect in all of his words, and he's perfect in all of his works. And what we're going to do, we're going to look at this by looking at what David said about God, what had happened to him that enabled him to actually say these things, and how can we, appro- how can we apply those truths to our lives. So we all have a vague idea about what perfect means. But this is what the dictionary definition says. Having all essential elements, unblemished, faultless, absolute, excellent in all respects. And the Hebrew word here is tormim, which means blameless, sincere, entire, whole, complete. Doesn't that wonderfully describe our God? He is perfect. So, God is perfect in all of his ways. When we first meet David, we meet him in 1 Samuel 16. And at that time, Israel had a king called Saul, who started off really well, but then took his eyes off God. And a bit of a long story, but he actually thought he knew better than God. He disobeyed God's instruction. And God tells the prophet Samuel, actually... Um, I have rejected Saul as king, and I want you to go to a man called Jesse, who is from Bethlehem, and one of his sons, they, he is the one that you're going to anoint to be the next king. You see, God knew Saul's heart, and he knew that Saul's heart wasn't seeking after him. So, as I'm sure you probably know, Samuel goes, Jesse parades his oldest, strongest sons before Samuel, Each time, Samuel thinks, yeah, this must be the one. He's tall. He could fight a battle. This must be the king. God says to Samuel, no, that's not him. And he basically goes through all the sons that he's got. Have you not got any more sons? Oh, yeah, I've got one who's out tending the sheep. Well, bring him in. This is what God says to Samuel. Verse 16, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him, talking about the other brothers. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You see, Samuel was thinking that physical prowess must be the thing that was most needed in a king, whereas God knew that most, what was most needed for uh, Israel was a man that was seeking after God's own heart as he often described David. And often we judge a situation in a completely different way to God. Sometimes he's got a completely different agenda because he's got a bigger picture than us. So you would think, okay, that's David sorted. He'll just take over from Saul. He'll meet his God-given destiny. Everything will be fabulous. But God had other plans. It was 15 years from David being anointed as king to him actually becoming king. 15 years. What's David doing in all that time? Or what's God doing with David in all that time? He's training him for being a king. In chapter 17, we see David killing Goliath. So David is learning to trust God when he's facing insurmountable opposition. Saul now knows David is going to be king. He's none too happy about it. So he tries to kill David. David escapes, but he spends lots and lots of chapters trying to escape, uh, trying to kill David, Saul does. David escapes, and he has numerous chances to kill Saul. But he spares his life. What's God doing in this situation? God's producing in David a tender, compassionate heart. A heart that produces psalms of praise but also one that can describe his feelings towards his circumstances. Probably quite unusual for a man at that time. Why are you downcast, O my soul, hoping God? David says it a lot in the Psalms. He's producing a compassionate heart in David that takes Mephibosheth, Katie's favorite person uh, that we've talked about in kids' life, uh, 
takes Mephibosheth, his best friend Jonathan's crippled son, into his home when his dad, Jonathan, was killed in the battle. Who's Jonathan's dad? Saul, the person who's tried to kill David all that time. So, so the Lord is producing in David the qualities in those 15 years, the qualities that he would need to be king. God is perfect in all of his ways. He knows what he's doing. So how about us? Are we feeling overwhelmed by what his life is throwing us? Do we feel like we're being battered by one thing after the other? Or do you feel like you're being, you're stuck in a monotonous life? You've got too much work to do. You've got a demanding boss. You've got lots of family commitments. What does 2 Samuel 2, 22, 31 say? This God, his way is perfect. Could it be that these situations you find yourself in, God has a much bigger plan than we could ever imagine? Could it be that we're in training for a much bigger or different role than we've got at present? Could it be that God in his infinite fatherly wisdom is allowing circumstances in our life in order that the fruit of the Spirit is developed in us. Isaiah 55, uh, these verses in Isaiah are verses I've thought a lot about in the last few weeks. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are as higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What we think is often, and how we perceive a situation is often not how God sees it at all. So let me ask you a question this morning. It's an important one, and this is one that I've struggled with the last few days preparing this. In the deepest part of you, is there a glad surrender to the way God has or is leading your life? Or, in the deepest part of you, do you wonder whether God's got it wrong. On those nights when you can't sleep, do you wonder whether he's got your best interests at heart, whether he cares at all? I'll repeat that. In the deepest part of you, is there a glad surrender to the way God's leading your life? Or do you wonder whether he's got it wrong? Did David experience this? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is what he says in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? That's at the beginning of Psalm 13. But by the end, this is what he says. Amelia, could I have Psalm 13 on, please? It says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So at the beginning of the psalm, he is feeling down in, down in, the, down in the depths. By the end of the psalm, he's remembered who God is. He's remembered God is perfect in all of his ways. I love that but at the start of verse 8 because it makes all the difference, doesn't it? So... We need to hang on to the truth of verse 31 in 2 Samuel. This God, his way is perfect. Why? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither his ways are not our ways. And I'm quite relieved about that. So, God is perfect in all of his ways. What else? God is perfect in all of his words. So, It says in our key verse for today, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. Now, we've already seen the outworking of one of uh, God's promises to David that he'd be king. The result, 15 years later, he's eventually made king and has rest from his enemies after a bit of to-ing and fro-ing. But so David thinks, you know what? It's not fair, is it, that I'm sat in this lovely palace And the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence, is still in a tent. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build him a tent. I'm going to build God a temple. God 
has different ideas. And in 2 Samuel 7, we see what God's words to David actually was. God promises that, yeah, there will be a temple built, but it won't be you, David, who builds it. It's your son Solomon who's going to build it. But God's promise to David. He says to David, verse 12 in 2 Samuel 7, your kingdom will last forever because one of your descendants will have an everlasting kingdom. One of your descendants, David, it's much bigger than a temple. One of your descendants is going to have an everlasting kingdom. So what do we do? We fast forward 14 generations and read these words. We read them every December. Luke chapter 1. He, Jesus, shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. God's promise to David still stays after 14 generations. When God speaks, it comes to pass. Just maybe not in our time scale. And often we want to do something, God to do something now. Okay, God, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm still waiting. God's time scale is often not our time scale. So those were God's, those were God's uh, promises to David. Let's see what God promises us. Let's, what about, what does he say through Paul? Let's read this. This is very applicable today, I think. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't know about you, but as I read those words, I'm getting to the end and I can feel my voice getting louder because I'm thinking, yes, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Can coronavirus? No, not at all. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Are there any exceptions if we're in Christ? Is there any, any, any exceptions? Not at all. Not at all. There is no exception. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Recently, I was reading the story of how Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, and it struck me how Jesus fought off the devil with words of scripture. And because he knew it was powerful in itself to thwart what the devil had planned for him. And we can quote these verses, you know, we can quote about Ephesians 6, about, you know, the word of God being a sword. We can quote the verses, but I don't know about you, but I'm really challenged to think, do I really know that in my heart? So I can, I know it up here, but do I really, really know it here? Do I really believe that God's word is so powerful It's my first point of call in my discipleship. Do I take God's warning seriously enough? Do I accept his commandments for what they are? Or do deep down, do I think, "Mm, it's just a suggestion really. You know, are are these commandments, well, they're, you know, the things that Jesus said, yeah, that's great. If you are a super saint like St. Paul or Mother Teresa or somebody like that. Are they just suggestions or are they commandments? At at Smash, uh, last time, we played a game, which we used to play as kids, called Sword Drill. And it's to try and get the kids to know about where things are in the Bible. Do you remember it, Aidan? Yeah? And um, we we said, why do you call it a sword drill? Because Paul talks about the word of God being a sword. Swords are a weapon used to attack. They used to defend Against, so we can use the word of God as, the, uh, as um, a defense against the attacks of the enemy. Attack him with God's word, not the lies that we might be listening to. So there's a situation. Me, I would probably start worrying. What should I be doing? I should be saying the words back that's in, that's in the Bible because the word of God is powerful. And I know in my heart I need to believe that, not just up here, but actually in here. 
It's got to go from, I don't know how many inches it is, from there to there. So, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. So, God is perfect in all of his ways. He's perfect in all of his words. Thirdly, God is perfect in all of his works. What does 2 Samuel 22 say? This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. It was great to hear um, what Andy was saying this morning. God is perfect in all of his works. And um, here we see David describing God as his refuge, his shelter, his safe haven, his hope. How did that work itself out in David's life? Well, he spent lots of time on the run, fleeing from Saul. He was even having to flee from his own son, Absalom. And ha- but have you noticed how God didn't completely remove the dangerous situation from David's life? But what he did do was he developed his relationship with David through the hard times. And in our life together, um, Simon and Marcel can testify that it's the hard times that we have experienced the closest to God. Um, just before Christmas, uh, Simon had a bit of a health scare. And um, like I've just said, I would be okay, then I would worry. And Simon would say, no love, don't worry, because I've got peace. And he's much better than I am. Uh, he, he trusted, he trusted God. He had a peace that passed that passes all understanding. But it's in the hard times, like Andy has testified this morning, it's in the hard times that we feel God's closeness the most. God is perfect in all of his works. But there's other ways we can see God's perfection in his works. What about creation? Can you imagine David? He's tending his sheep. He's lying down. He's looking up at the stars and saying... Psalm 8, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You can imagine him, can't you? Lying there, his sheep are asleep, he's tending his sheep, he's looking at the stars and thinking, wow, what is man that you are mindful of me? You might know that we go to Wales a lot and I remember we'd arrived just one summer night must have been a Friday night. The stars had just come out. There's no lights where our place is in Wales. The sky was so clear, you looked up and you could see hundreds and hundreds of stars. Amazing, it was. I'm sure you've been to some beautiful places. Sandy beaches, waterfalls, string mountains. Or, to go tiny, you've got your magnifying glass out and you've looked at the insects in your garden, really looked at them? Or have you experienced the pinnacle of God's creation when you witness the ch- your child being born? It baffles me, you know, that people can look at all this creation and not recognize that behind it there's this perfect designer. It baff- to be honest, it baffles me. It absolutely baffles me. So we see that God is perfect in all of his ways in creation, but also in salvation. God sent his son into the world to live a perfect life, to become the perfect sacrifice for our sin, to die on the cross and take the punishment that should have been ours so we can be reconciled to God. That is amazing work. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus is returning. This world will be made perfect once more. The perfection of Eden, Garden of Eden, restored. God will dwell with man. Revelation. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Hallelujah. So, let's set our hearts on him. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God 
but the Lord. No one. Who is a rock except our God? No one. All other gods are false imitation. That's going to be smashed tonight uh, for those of you who are listening. Ten Commandments. So, let's pray. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Father, we praise you and thank you for your perfection. The perfection of your ways, they are higher than our ways. And your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. For the perfection of your words, your words of love to us, your words of promise to us. Father, help us really believe them, put them into practice. Let us use them as a sword. And you are perfect in all of your works. We praise you for the beauty of creation. We praise you for the wonder of your salvation. And we thank you that we know, because your word is true, that you are returning. You will wipe every tear from our eye, and we will be with you. What a wonderful, wonderful promise this morning, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. Help us, Lord, to live in the truth of what we've heard. Amen.